This film took us about five years to make, from the initial idea to raising the money, getting the permission to film the aerials, which was very difficult, and then the ground photography. We filmed this over, uh, we started in 2010, the filming of the aerials, then we, we continued filming in 2012 and finished in 2013. Here we are in 2014, uh, and so it is a long process. It was very difficult. It was one of the hardest films I've ever made. Uh, just to get the permissions to film the aerials or to film within some of the these holy sites to film within the Dome of the Rock or the the mosque it took three years of negotiation uh, of, of hundreds of cups of tea of diplomacy of really building trust with the various communities and so uh, you know when we presented the script for this film to the to the mayor of Jerusalem and to the governor of East Jerusalem and the police and so forth they looked at us and said you're crazy you know you'll never get half of what's on the page and I'm, I'm pleased to say that we got everything that was on the page but only through the efforts of our Israeli crew, of our Palestinian crew, of our international crew, working together uh, to make this possible. I had several hats on this film, so I was producing the film, I was directing the film, and I was writing the film, and oftentimes uh, when I was in a writing mode, I would have to sort of shut off the others and just be a writer and lock myself in a room. And, uh, you know, this is a subject that's so sensitive that every word is important. And uh, that's why I think, you know, we have Benedict Cumberbatch who narrates the film in English, and uh, he was excellent because he was so well prepared. And he challenged me on so many of the levels. We played with language together. Uh, we had many advisors. We had over 40 advisors review the script and suggest slight changes in wording. So I was not alone in this. But I think the writing of this film is one of the hardest things that I've done, uh, apart from making the film on location. Uh, this is not an easy film to write and to actually please all of the different groups that want to come and see this film. We filmed this movie with five different camera systems, actually. Uh, most of the film was shot with IMAX film. It's a 15 per 70 millimeter negative film, and that is still the best resolution capture. However, these are large cameras. They sound like machine guns. They're the size of washing machines, and they're just not great for intimate uh, scenes. And I wanted to balance the movie between spectacle and intimacy. And so we had digital cameras, uh, the Red Epic that we put on Steadicam. We used the Sony F65 camera. We were the first film crew ever to use this camera in a 3D configuration. Uh, the film is not playing at the Ontario Science Centre in 3D, it's on a dome, but in many markets it is in 3D, it was shot in 3D, designed for 3D, and then we used a, a time-lapse system as well. So we had all kinds of different tools for the right use. So for night photography, for underground photography, we used one system. For the interviews, for something intimate, we used another. To make the audience feel like they were moving through the streets, we used another system. And for the time-lapse photography, where we can see a complete day or several days moving over the city to get this timeless quality, the sweep of thousands of years of history over the city, we used another system. So it was about applying the right tools to the right trade. Well, I think one of our greatest achievements on this film was the aerial photography, and this was thanks to months of, of effort on the part of our Israeli line producer, Noam Shalev, and his team in the highlight, but s particularly to Dubi Tal, our aerial director, who is one of Israel's leading aerial photographers, and uh, Dubi knew where to go, when to go, to be at Masada at 7 a.m. in the morning to get the right light and the right seasons. And it's really thanks to him that we were able to get the, the permissions to do this, to go all the way up the government levels and to build the trust to do this because aerials haven't been filmed at this altitude over Jerusalem for at least 20 years. And so it's a remarkable achievement on the part of many different entities to make this happen. And I don't even know if it'll happen again, frankly. We were so privileged on this film to get access to the holy places in a way that you really can't otherwise. The access that we had to the mosque, to Al-Aqsa Mosque, to the Dome of the Rock, uh, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where we were locked inside the church for an entire night. The access that we had to the Western Wall, to the Western Wall tunnels, to over the wall when we were able to put a crane over top of the Western Wall in the middle of the priestly blessing, to fly a helicopter 500 feet over the old city. I mean these are things that I consider myself really fortunate to have been a part of this. It's, it's a huge privilege. You know, every day was a challenge on this, on this film. And so, for example, uh, I think that uh, even when we filmed the three girls, you know, uh, 
I asked each of them to take me on a tour of their city when I was doing the research and they didn't meet each other but you know they took me to some of the same places and they told me stories that almost overlapped you know one girl would take me to a site and say this was where the ritual bath and the temple was and I would say do you know anything about the story of Jesus and, no I don't know anything do you know about the mosque no I would bring the Muslim to the same place and she would say well this is where the mosque is and there was a big palace here and and I would realize that they're their narratives are so close, they're overlapping, and yet they don't know very much about each other. And so the stereotypes they had of each other when they finally met, you know, it was, we all laughed because they said, well, I thought you had to wear the headscarf as a Muslim all the time. No, well, aren't you supposed to wear black and white all the time? Are you allowed to wear jeans? And so the stories of the, the stereotypes that people would have and the jokes that they would play on one another, if, you know, Israelis to Palestinian, Christian, Muslim, Jew, I think it really broke the ice and it allowed us to, you know, to have, have have a lot of fun in a place that traditionally is seen as very serious. One of the shots that we did uh, was the first Friday of Ramadan. I always wanted to film hundreds of thousands of Muslims bowing in prayer. And it was a shot everyone said, you're never going to get this, just give up. And we figured out that the only way we could do it was to train a Muslim crew how to use the cameras and then smuggle the cameras in. Uh, to the mosque area and so what we did was we took the camera apart into tiny pieces and smuggled it in through the food the night before so you know the lens went in with the rice and the body went in with the bread and so forth and about five minutes before prayer they snuck the camera out put it together and you know they telephoned me and said how does this look and I said oh tilt over a little bit and roll and they roll they got the prayer they took the camera down they ran out of there I mean it was, that was what it took to get these kinds of shots and so we can laugh about it now but at the time uh, well, this film was a journey for me I made 14 trips to Jerusalem and on every trip I learned something new I learned something new about archaeological Jerusalem I mean going underground and seeing uh, for example some of these cities that are buried one on top of the other it's phenomenal how rich Jerusalem is a small place and yet be below ground uh, there are so many cities to explore I learned about the people of Jerusalem and how diverse it is I've traveled extensively but I've never seen a city where there's so many different cultures in such a small space and everyone relating to the city in their own way and so I feel like after 14 trips I've barely scratched the surface this is a city that constantly surprises you the moment you think you understand Jerusalem it slips out of your fingers and you realize you know you it's it's almost impossible to understand Jerusalem completely it's a city you can walk with your heart you can walk with your senses, pure senses, follow your ears, follow your eyes, and you will go to such amazing places. I lived in Jerusalem for 20 years and I still do that, and every time I discover a new place. Uh, no matter where you come from, no matter if you know anything about Jerusalem or not, that you find something you can relate to, but also something that's completely surprising to you. Um, I've tried to compose the shots in the movie in a way that you think it's about one thing, and then somehow it changes and it becomes about something else and then even maybe about something else. You think it's about a Jewish site and then all of a sudden you realize it has a significance for Christians and Muslims as well. And that's this idea of the city as this onion layer that you're continually peeling away the layers and at the moment you think that you've peeled away the last layer it turns out there's like another onion in there. So that's Jerusalem. We were lucky to have about 40 advisors on this film, and yes, we had uh, theological advisors, we had archaeological advisors, we had cultural advisors, and so forth. I wouldn't say that we relied uh, heavily on, on politicians, for example, and this is a film that we, we didn't want to get mired in politics for various reasons, but I think we just didn't want to be naive. It was very important for us that we look at making uh, an even-handed film, a film that isn't propaganda, that doesn't promote one side over the other, that allows Jerusalemites, people who live in Jerusalem, to tell their own stories of what it's like to live in the city, to grow up in the city, and, uh, and then to throw it open to the audience so the audience can experience what is it like to be Jewish or Christian or Muslim in Jerusalem? What is it like to be an archaeologist in Jerusalem? Well, one of the great things about working in Jerusalem as an archaeologist is the fact that it's a living city. That is, it's been continuously inhabited for thousands of years, which means that always new things are coming to light as new buildings are built or new excavations are being done. There's always something new to discover and that makes it all the more exciting. Jerusalem is amazing in that there are over 2,000 archaeological sites in the city. Uh, that's a huge number. Many of them are no longer active but if you want 
you can come to Jerusalem and you can find uh, meaning by going to the holy places. The importance of continuing to excavate in Jerusalem is that just like any other kind of archaeological experience, it's contributing to our understanding of the past. It's giving us a framework for understanding um, the human experience writ large, what's happened over the course of time, where have we come from, and perhaps where are we going. Personally, I do not believe that somebody can understand the Middle Eastern conflict today without understanding the past. You can come as a scientific tourist as well. You can come and look at how is it that we know what we know about Jerusalem through texts, through maps, through mosaics, through photographs, and through archaeology, through science, really. And that's something that surprises people because they think Jerusalem and science, and yet science is completely revolutionizing our understanding of Jerusalem, our understanding of the past, and, and, and how Western civilization was shaped. And I think we forget that so many of the stories and the events that happened in Jerusalem shaped our lives in ways that we don't understand. And when we look at it through a scientific lens, from a scientific point of view, it gives us this very healthy understanding of where we came from, where we might be going, why Jerusalem is important. Uh, and for me, it's a nice balance. So we have a Jewish voice and a Christian voice and a Muslim voice, and we have a secular voice as well. I think for people who don't necessarily relate to religion, it's a fundamental part of understanding the whole picture of the city. Well, science isn't always about the latest technology. Science develops from a history of ideas. It, it develops from cultural backdrops which uh, form the ways in which we think, the, the style of thinking, the critical approach we take to looking at the universe and the world around us. It's always important to understand that we can't see science as context-free. We have to see science as being connected to who we are and to our cultures. So sometimes we take a step and we look for that connection because we know that there are things like conflicts in the world that are often between major religions. The fact that this particular uh, film allows that dialogue to be surfaced means the Science Center can show that it's a community builder. The Science Center can show that, that it fosters the dialogue between major groups in the world. And the sci science uh, is seen as being connected to cultures. So it is important for the Science Center to be seen as a place where cultural discussions are held as well as some of the finer, more um, detailed aspects of, of the latest scientific discoveries. These things go together.